Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Lori Enns, the SSH Writing Center Coordinator at Nazarbayev University, uh, where all students, staff, and faculty are eligible for online one-on-one -on -one writing appointments. To find out more about this, please visit our website. Now, normally we hold our writing workshops at the university in a classroom face-to-face, -face, but it's summer 2020 and we can't do that this summer, so our workshops are now webinars. This is the eighth in our series for this summer, and this one will focus on uh, reform formulating a research question. And it will be delivered by Theodora Serenian, who I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute. But before we do that, I just want to send around my poll. So I'm going to send you a poll. Let us know who you are. Uh, you might be a student <clears throat> at NU or not. Let me just launch that. Perfect. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much for the introduction and for organizing uh, this webinar series. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about going back to the basics uh, when you're thinking about formulating a research question. So depending, maybe you aren't even exactly sure what your research topic is yet. You're toying around with a couple different ideas. Um, but different divergent thinking and connective inquiry practices that you can employ to begin honing in on what it is exactly that you want to do. So the agenda today is to, I want to start out by creating a, a simple sort of, or maybe complex, overarching definition of critical thinking. Uh, and then we're going to define and explore differences between convergent and divergent thinking and discuss why divergent connective inquiry is really especially crucial now in the 21st century, and I would say now in this moment in 2020. And then we'll conclude by exploring some actual divergent brainstorm activities that students or teachers uh, can use to begin thinking about forming research questions. So I'd like to start out uh, checking in with the audience briefly and just ask some people, students especially, uh, to weigh in in words, phrases, doesn't have to be complete sentences, but what is critical thinking? If you were asked to define that phrase, how would you? I like to start out um, my semester by asking this because it's a word that's used a lot. It's thrown around, but I think that there's assumptions that everybody understands what it is. So if you don't mind weighing in, what do you think when you think of the term critical thinking? Oh, and you can send your uh, answers through the chat or through Q&A. Okay, someone says critical thinking is the ability to rate the quality of information. To rate the quality of information. Mm -hmm. Somebody okay. else says looking at a problem from different angles. Great. So those are both absolutely parts of critical thinking. One of the sort of simple things I start out with with students is this idea that, that critical thinking is a matter of separating the whole into parts in order to see relationships. And whatever the whole is, is completely contextual. It could be this conversation, it could be a movie you just saw, a conversation you have with a friend, it could be a scholarly paper, but separating the whole of it to see how it functions. In tandem with that, though, it's also a process of putting things back together into new contexts to discover new relationships between subjects, ideas, information, people, etc. Um, Einstein called this process combinatorial thinking, which I find to be kind of a mouthful. Uh, the journalist Warren Berger, who we'll talk a little bit more down the road, uses the term connective inquiry, which I think functions much better. Not that I'm criticizing Einstein. Uh, good critical thinkers, this is where it gets a little more complicated, are both skeptical and open-minded, which might seem a little bit like a paradox, right? Um, but they need to be both rational and objective, skeptical, but also open-minded and aware that critical thinking is non-linear and non-binary often, right? And anybody who's done any research knows that research is not really a linear process a lot of the time. It doesn't go from A to B to C. Oftentimes you have to step forward two steps and move back three. You go in circles, you chase your tail, you fall down a rabbit hole. So oftentimes critical thinking is not a straight line. And so too, by non-binary, what I mean is, is oftentimes, especially in the social sciences, there isn't necessarily one absolute answer. Something isn't A or B. It's not either or. Oftentimes, there's a lot of in-between, okay? So 
I think tied in with all of that is this idea that we need to be as critical thinkers crucially aware that people's implicit beliefs matter, that people, the beliefs and the ideas that people have that they bring to the table is really, really imperative to be aware of because those beliefs inform their actions. And we're all biased, subjective people, even scientists. So effective critical thinking also involves taking all this into account, both convergent and divergent thinking. So what is convergent and divergent thinking? Many of you are maybe aware of these two terms, but there are two cognitive approaches to critical thinking. Convergent is linear, it's systematic, it looks for a single best answer. So an example is a simple math equation, two plus two equals four. Another example would be uh, a multiple choice question on a standardized test. You're asked a question and you're given usually three to four answers and you need to choose the best single answer. So we all know what convergent thinking is. Divergent thinking is different. It's creative, it's nonlinear. It seeks to come up with alternative answers to a question or a problem. So if I were to give everybody in the audience a pile of Lego blocks, even if I gave you the same exact Lego blocks to each individual, invariably, many of you would come up with a multitude of different structures. Okay, so there's a really great example of divergent thinking. Now, depending on the academic field, one approach may be more popular, but they're not mutually exclusive strategies. And in fact, often people benefit from using them in tandem. But in the 20th century, especially uh, in the West, you know, systems began, especially educational systems, really began to rely heavily on convergent thinking as the main approach to critical thinking, and, and I would say the main approach to education. Um, that's changed a lot in the 21st century and is continuing to change exponentially uh, because our entire understanding of the value of information is changing. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but I wanted to just sort of give you a couple more visuals in thinking about the way that you can use divergent and convergent thinking together. Um, neurologist Ken Heilman says that divergent thinking is inherently a form of question asking, that there's inquiry inherent to divergence. And studies have shown that this kind of thinking happens in the right hemisphere of the brain, which is more creative. So if you're tackling a project, if it's an idea, if it's a research question, if you start with divergent thinking, you sort of take a bird's eye view of things and think really openly. What are the needs? What are possible solutions? You know, there's no reason that you can't do some out of the box thinking before beginning to hone in and focus in on more convergent intellect. Where exactly to focus your time? What are the core needs? So this is an example for design process, but you could apply this sort of, and I like that it's a little bit messy, right? You can apply this to anything. Another example that many people here are probably familiar with is this deductive and inductive reasoning, which has lots of different meanings. This is sort of just using it in the context of the social sciences, uh, but you can, you can sort of see the parallels between deductive and inductive and convergent and divergent. So, Deductive is the one we're usually most familiar with. It's the top-down approach in sciences. It's considered by many to be sort of the gold standard of scientific research. You begin with a theory, you, you go through a hypothesis observation, and you either, you know, confirm or, or not your theory. And it's excellent, except that if it's only used in, without other approaches in a vacuum, then scientists often fall prey to all sorts of cognitive biases. You know, for example, the classic example is confirmation bias, right? The need to try to make sure that that theory is correct because you've invested so much time in it. So applying some inductive reasoning along the way at the beginning and also sort of alternating back and forth through your research, it's more exploratory. It looks at existing theories from different perspectives. It pays attention to trends social processes, people's implicit beliefs, to begin observing patterns and to create that tentative hypothesis in a more well-rounded way. So 
Warren Berger wrote this book in 2014. He was a journalist. He went out and he wanted to discover why successful people, notably innovators and, and business folks, seemed particularly good at asking questions and why their question asking seemed to in turn make them so successful. But along the way, he sort of discovered that question asking seems to often be discouraged, especially in places like uh, places of employment and even in schools. So I want to ask the audience briefly if you, why you think question asking is often discouraged and if, if you've experienced direct, you know, experiences where people have discouraged you from asking questions and why you think that might occur in society. So Berger sort of had this three prong idea that, you know, at the beginning, we sort of, we take the, we take the idea of questioning for granted because we think that it's okay to ask lots of questions. And when you're young, you know, you're ignorant, you just have a lack of knowledge. And so children ask a lot of questions in order to create an understanding of the world around them and their existence in it. And invariably along the way they get answers, they learn how to tie their shoes, they have all these things that they begin to understand. So there is a decrease in asking questions that's natural. However, he also posits that we start to be really taught the importance of convergent thinking over divergent thinking. And we, we start to ask less questions because we begin to fall into that pattern, right? And this creates this sort of status quo where we, we become afraid to ask questions because we're afraid of being wrong because having the answer seems to be so valuable, right? And this, you know, we live in a convergent society, teachers, parents, advertising, TV, textbooks, they're all telling us that we have this answer. So it begins this thing where we, we start to ask less questions. And it's also great that people talked about the idea of the hierarchy and power, like in many instances in institutions, in, in businesses, in schools, asking questions can be perceived as inefficient. You know, why fix something if it's not broken? It can seem risky and it can even seem subordinate, right? It can seem to be threatening the people in the position of power. Um, and yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. So, Berger also goes on to posit that that's all changing, okay, that our understanding of information is really changing in the 21st century. And a couple of geniuses over at Harvard, innovation professors have talked about this idea that the value of explicit information is dropping. Uh, uh, someone in the cohort with Paul Bettino, Tony Wagner at Harvard talks about information as a commodity. And he says that because we're overwhelmed with data, there's a glut of information thanks to the almighty internet, the value of answers is actually dropping and the value of questions is in turn rising because what really matters now is what you can do with the information alternatively, divergently. And a lot of that comes down to asking questions. So this creates this sort of paradox, this 21st century knowledge paradox. Well, because the value of answers is dropping, we don't have to do as much memorization anymore, for example, which is great and it's excellent. It's wonderful that we have a place to go for all of these answers and we can save brain space. But because of this dynamic, this overabundance, we're also doing a lot of passive thinking. I always use the example, you know, when, have you ever been at dinner with a bunch of friends and you can't remember, you know, the actor who was in that movie that time and the first thing that you all do is you just run and get your phones because you can look it up on Wikipedia. But that's also making us sort of a lazy, lazy thinkers. Um, and we need to be thinking more actively because as the collective knowledge increases, thinking differently, divergently is becoming much more valuable. And an example that I found recently that I really liked because it, these guys reminded me of, of uh, NU students because I'm, I'm constantly impressed by how innovative uh, the students here are. I just had a student this week who started their own business last year for, for greener energy, actually. So it was kind of a nice parallel. But in 2015, these two guys, Amit Gudka and Hayden Wood, they co-founded this company, Bulb. Um, in the UK after being really confused and frustrated by their own home energy bills. They worked in the energy sector and they'd get home at the end of the day and they still couldn't understand their own bills, you know, and they asked the question, why is this system so complex and expensive? They themselves couldn't answer it working in the industry. How's the average consumer supposed to understand? So before they even innovated their company and, and moved into Britain's energy sector on their own, they had to use connective inquiry to understand how the system itself functioned before. So 
just to check in again, what's the connection between counting squares and innovation? I asked folks who are filing into the, to the webinar today to count at the beginning. How many squares did people find? How many squares are there? <clears throat> okay, you can send your answers again through the chat or the Q&A. I think someone at the beginning said 16. 16. Uh, we had one person answer at the beginning, but um, anybody have a different answer? Twenty-eight, eighty-four, twenty-two, twenty-two. A number of people are saying twenty-two. Okay. You said one was eighty-four. Uh huh. <clears throat> okay, great. Did anybody? So, did anybody come up with thirty? I'm seeing a sixty-four. I don't see a thirty. Okay, right. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Okay, so this came from, I did, I did not come up with this. Uh, in the 2013, the Harvard Business Review blog posted this square and, and they asked their audience exactly what I asked you, which was, you know, what's the connection between counting squares? How many squares can you count? Those were the only rules they gave them. And so the sort of this, this, the standard, the traditional number that many people come up with is 30 because there's, there's 16 one by one squares and there's nine two by two squares, four three by three squares. I, I couldn't come up with a graphic where I could draw all over this and make it clear. But then the, the one four by four square. So sort of the traditional max thing that keep, people came up with was 30 squares. But there were a few folks who wrote in who made the claim that you could actually double that number and that you could see 60 squares because there are 30 squares that are outlined in black and then there are 30 squares that are outlined in white. So it was kind of a, a neat example of that thinking outside of the box, thinking divergently. And as I like to tell my students, you know, know, know the guidelines and how to work in and outside those guidelines, right? 84, I'm impressed by and I, I, I would be really curious to know more about how whoever came up with that could see all of those. <clears throat> so to move on with this idea of connective inquiry, uh, I, this, I really like this, you know, now that I've criticized Einstein at the beginning of the webinar, I'd like to bring it back around and say that, you know, I really love this quote by him where he said famously that the formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution. Uh, which can may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. And I kind of like that aligning it with this passage from the Foundation for Critical Thinking, which is a really interesting organization out of Cambridge, Cambridge Massachusetts, which really works on um, critical thinking pedagogy. And they say, we do not understand critical thinking as something additional to content, but rather as integral to it. We focus therefore on teaching students to learn not random bits and pieces of information, and this is my emphasis, but systems, organized networks of concepts, active modes of thinking. And I love that phrase, active modes of thinking, because critical thinking is, it's not that passive thinking I was talking about, it's active, it's inquisitive, and it's understanding this idea that everything is personally, I believe, always connected. <clears throat> So in terms of bulb, to go back to Ami um, and Hayden again, what they needed to do before they tackled what they wanted to do is figure out what was wrong. So they used connective inquiry and they came up with this theory that they said, basically that the energy sector in the UK, the status quo of the energy sector has four main problems, inefficiency, poor service, expensive tariffs, and dirty energy. And so their divergent solutions were bold. They wanted to lower prices while still committing to only using 100% renewable energy. Um, they did some fairly non-traditional, maybe not as non-traditional now, this was 2015, but fairly non-traditional social media marketing. They incentivized this big word of mouth referral campaign where they gave people discounts who referred others. And they promised a single energy tariff for all customers, plus very simple, clear, understandable, paperless monthly bills, which again, doesn't seem that wild, but a lot of energy companies refuse to send things in, in paperless form. So were they successful? Well, today Bulb is the UK's largest renewable energy supplier and they still only use 100% renewable energy, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, they still have a single low tariff for all their customers and they sort of started this, this major sea change. All these other green energy companies started up after them. However, they still managed to keep their standard plan 18% lower than their, their green energy competitors. 
um, and they've been labeled two years running the fastest growing private company in the UK um, by Bohurst. So they have managed to, to do things that seemed risky and divergent and actually made a successful company that is making profit. <clears throat> Another example before we turn to some activities that students can do for their research topic is this word that I discovered recently that I've sort of been mulling over in my mind, which is this term syndemic. Um, sort of talking about briefly about the elephant in the room, the pandemic that we're all living through right now. But um, the word syndemic is not new. It was coined in the 1990s by Meryl Singer, who's an anthropologist, but it sort of has come back into fashion recently, even pre-pandemic in 2019 when it was reintroduced in a Lancet article um, written partially by Emily Mendenhall. And it's this idea that research on syndemics explores how two or more diseases, so actually talking about epi epidemiological diseases, cluster together, but how also how social, political, economic, and ecological factors drives those clusters, right? So how society intersects with disease. Um, and Mendenhall, one of the authors, sort of brought this into the context of the pandemic this past March in an article by Think Global Health. And she said that a syndemic emphasizes the fact that no disease exists in isolation and the interaction and clustering of two or more conditions is exacerbated by broader factors. So like social inequality, for example. Recognizing social and political drivers of COVID-19 as equally as vital to the medical drivers is part of what makes this condition syndemic. For me personally, this has been really helpful because when I feel overwhelmed by something, understanding things critically just sort of helps me cope. And so I think that it's, it's, it's great to consider um, how can we relate critical thinking to practices in our daily lives right now. So this is, this is an example of a, of a divergent activity that people can do. This is borrowed from the Texas Medical Association. They put this activity risk matrix out recently for people to consider um, how they might navigate moving through public spaces and in public situations, which is something that we all have to really, I mean, I stop and think about it before I step outside the door now, right? So how can we protect ourselves? How can we protect our families? How can we protect our communities? And so you can see the, the y-axis, largest benefits, smallest benefits of, of social activities or, or moving through public spaces. And then the, the x-axis is the lowest and highest risk in, in accordance with, with health, right? With the best practices that, that science is telling us. And, this is uh, this word fluid is being used quite a bit now when we talk about how changeable our environments and our experiences during the pandemic. So this is inevitably going to change, but this is a simple divergent activity that you can do with a, with a piece of scrap paper, uh, paying attention to, you know, what the scientists, what the World Health Organization and CDC are saying in terms of changeability and, and paying attention to what you need to do to keep yourself safe. So Let's transition to talking about some activities, some other activities that you can do in terms of whatever it is you're thinking about your research. Um, how can you actually employ all of the things that I've just been talking about? And I love this quote by Berger. One of the most important things questioning does is enable people to think and act in the face of uncertainty. And we are in, in unprecedentedly, at least in our lifetime, uh, uncertain times. Um, and to go back to that question I asked earlier about why students or, or the audience thinks that question asking is often discouraged, Berger is a big proponent of this idea of neoteny. And neoteny is the retention of childlike attributes. And so in the context of this, what he says is he discovered those innovators, those business people, those really successful thinkers. He said they're all really comfortable with admitting when they don't know things which is difficult. It takes a lot of practice. Um, I think that you can get better with practice. As a teacher, I spent a lot of time always being really nervous that I had to know the answer for everything and, and having that anxiety every time I stepped into a class. And it still exists. I mean, I was nervous about this, this webinar today. Um, but, but acknowledging when you don't know something is, is a great way to start figuring out what you, what you need to know and also figuring out what you do know. So Asking questions helps us acknowledge what we don't so that we can figure out what we need to know and also what parts of a topic, what niche parts incite our curiosity because that is the most fundamental thing to a sustainable research project. It's sort of the first base that I ask all students about. 
do you, are you passionate about this topic? Are you interested in this topic? And if I get any sort of a lukewarm answer, you know, I encourage them to consider maybe why they don't feel passionate about it and if they want to consider something else. Because your topic is something that you need to be able to have a sustained interest in for a long period of time. Then we also need to figure out from there, is this question researchable? Is there existing research? Is there accurate research, continuing opening discourse, or are you sort of inventing things from scratch? In which case it may not be a tenable topic and you may not be able to craft a tenable question. Um, so briefly, can a couple people in the audience weigh in? Are, did they come here today with like specific research topics in mind? I'm just curious to know what people are thinking about half the time when I ask any new students what their topic is, I don't understand it at all, which is fine. But I'm just curious if anybody came here today with a research topic that they want to share. You can send it through the chat or through the Q&A. Do you already have a research topic and you're trying to refine it? So we have somebody looking into the benefits of play for child development. Sounds like somebody at GSE, perhaps. Oh, here we go. Somebody is looking into um, uh, leadership, teaching leadership in universities in Kyrgyzstan. Okay, so I think that the thing, the three things I'm about to show you are, 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 would be useful for all of these, which is sort of why they're, they're large and they're simple and they're very, um, these are, these are easily modified activities. You can change the directions, you can change the order of them depending on what you wanna do. Um, so <clears throat> that's also part of the reason I like to present it too is you can really make of these activities what you will. But this first one I'm gonna show you, I call it developing a working knowledge. <clears throat> Say you have a topic, you know, to understand you need to create topic, uh, excuse me, you need to create context for that topic. So uh, the directions I had for today for myself were, <clears throat> excuse me, write two to three questions for each of the column. Do not overthink your questions. They're not all gonna be good. I always really um, reinforce this idea for students. This is a low stakes exercise, okay? This means don't overthink it. Just sort of see where you're, use that right hemisphere of your brain. Um, so who, what, where, when, why, how, kind of the easiest layperson's definition of context. Say that my topic is South African apartheid. I ask two questions for each of the columns and I'm not gonna read through all of them because for the sake of time, I'll just read a few. So who created this racial caste system? What are some ways the abolished system of apartheid still affects South Africa, either economically or socially? Where in the country were people most affected? When did South African apartheid begin? Why did it start? Why do people often submit to immoral behavior by government or people in power? How have human rights in South Africa changed since the abolishment of apartheid? So you throw out a bunch of questions, which students often find is actually much more difficult. It may seem like an easy exercise, but especially if you ask them to do as many as you can in say three minutes, and it's, it's quantity over quality, it can actually be pretty, pretty uh, challenging because they sort of sit there wanting to write the most perfect thing. But the point is, is that this should be messy. So once you've done that, you read through the questions and you think about what you notice about them. And, and I sort of give you a little bit of a clue here, but think in terms of size. And so as you look at the questions, what you might notice is that some of the questions seem smaller than other ones. So when did South African apartheid begin? Or who created this racial caste system? Those might not seem like big enough questions for a research topic, and that's because they absolutely aren't. So when you start asking yourself lots of questions, part of the issue is you need to categorize them into closed questions versus open questions. And I'm of the mind that they're both valuable at the start, right? Because closed questions can help you figure out what you need to learn about your topic. What year did apartheid begin? Well, it's a closed question because it has an answer, 1948. But if you're just starting out with this topic and you don't know the answer to that, then you need to go do some preliminary research about your topic, right? And everybody's gonna come to a topic with different knowledge. Many students are doing things that are part of their majors, right? Part of their disciplines, it's in their wheelhouse. So they may have a better working knowledge, but sometimes students wanna try and explore something that they don't know much about. 
So closed questions build context, but they don't ultimately make good research questions because they're too small. Although bear in mind, I, I think closed questions, often the definition says that a closed question has one answer. I sort of find that debatable because while apartheid began in 1948, it ended in the 1990s. It took years for this system to be taken apart and different legislation passed and all that sort of thing. So closed questions aren't always simple and they can lead, I think, to much more open, interesting, researchable questions, which are those open questions. They require more complex answers. They're often debatable answers because of you know, new scientific understanding, human elements like opinions, ideology, bias, et cetera, conflicting agendas. So those are the questions that you can really dig into and um, come up with an excellent and tenable research question. Also bear in mind that really massive, enormous open questions and I sort of invariably always get one or two students in my 150 course who want to do a meaning of life question, right? What's the meaning of existence? Do all dogs go to heaven? I don't know if it's the poet in me, but I have a real soft spot for that. <laughs> but oftentimes in the context of a class or in the context of your, your duration at in university, those really, really massive existential theological questions may not be tenable. So we kind of have to rein it in a little bit. So this is just to show you back to the, this is sort of part two of the divergent activity work, but now you're working toward a research question. So all the questions that are still highlighted in white, I would say are more closed questions. They're things that are uh, potentially com have complex answers, but they're, they're already answers, they exist. And you need, to, you need to know those answers before you dig more deeply. The questions that are in black, those are working toward open, being open questions and potentially you can find a question and revise it that is actually becomes your own research question. So all of this is working toward that just right question, um, which is known by some people as the Goldilocks equation, which is also used throughout different disciplines. I've been told that here in Kazakhstan, the story of Goldilocks is, is actually known as Masha and the Three Bears. Um, so with Masha and the three bears, I'm assuming the stories are similar where, you know, she sneaks into the bear's house and she eats their porridge and one of the bulls is too hot, one of the bulls is too cold, but then there's that porridge that's just the right temperature. So that's, that's the question that you want to find, the just right question. So I revised the questions from the last slide and came up with two working research questions. And I always ask students to use that working term with their research question and also with their thesis right up until the end to be open to the idea that, that it might change. Um, so the first question is, in what ways are Black South African millennials in post-apartheid 2020 facing systemic racial discrimination as lingering after effects of the abolished system? Is it perfect? No, it's definitely wordy. But this is a question that's focusing sort of on the problem, right? What's still going on that's, that's, that's uh, an issue in the country in the context of this? Research question number two is kind of looking at it from a different angle. How are black and white South African millennials in 2020 working together to combat lingering after effects of the abolished system of apartheid? So this is sort of looking more toward the solution, which is an angle I suggest to students, obviously the problem and the solution, everything's connected, right? They go hand in hand. But um, when students are tackling, especially really, you know, frustrating and, and sometimes disturbing problems, I ask the student, well, do you want to, do you want to focus on the problem or do you have problem fatigue? Do you want to, do you want to focus on the solution? And that's kind of a nice way to think divergently and contextualize for yourself in terms of your curiosity, what angle do I want to approach this subject from? Okay. So this last activity, again, you could put this one first. If you really are just coming to the topic from a very, very macro view and you're not sure what you want to ex exactly explore, you could start with this. I call it finding your niche topic. So if you say you have something massive like artificial intelligence, this is just another divergent activity you can use to brainstorm things that interest you. So the categories this time are people, trends, controversies, places, impact, and then relationships, which all of this is a great connective inquiry exercise, but that relationship section is usually the most challenging because it's when you need to have a pretty good working knowledge of things. So 
I put a bunch, there's a lot of text in here. I don't expect everybody to read it, but just to show you what it might end up looking like. I ask you to write three things that you think you know about artificial intelligence in the context of each category. And I say that think because we often find out that we don't really know as much as we thought or what we thought we knew was wrong and being open to being wrong. So write three things that you think you know in each category and then for each one of those, write a question in turn, okay? And if you can't come up with something you know, then just write the question. But the ones that I'll just highlight the ones or, or uh, comment on the ones in black. So for example, under trends, I asked what emerging AI trends are happening in learning management software because we're all dealing with changing right now, the changing context of moving our lives online. For me as an educator, I'm sort of, I'm, 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 I'm both excited and worried about the learning curve for myself. I'm wondering, you know, how does it, what does this mean for the long run? I have all these questions that are, are definitely related to, to my own personal life. Then under controversies, I've talked about artificial intelligence in the context of self-driving cars, which is a totally different niche subject of AI, right? So how many instances so far of successful self-driving cars versus unsuccessful accidents? Over in places, another an entirely different question. China, right, that's in the news a lot right now. How might AI be used to enforce a new national security law for Hong Kong? Then I go down to impact, another totally different context, the impact of facial recognition software during the coronavirus pandemic right now. And then under relationships, I start thinking about the, the relationship between AI and healthcare and how artificial in, intelligence in hospitals, it might help organize patient data, but then it could also potentially make some people's jobs obsolete. So there's just, this is casting a really, really wide net. Um, it's just to get your brain, it's a good brain exercise. So once you've done something like this, then you can start moving your niche topic and asking yourself how this might become something tenable. And the sort of the, the, the things I outlined for what makes a research question tenable is, again, the curiosity factor. Are you still interested in this topic? Will you be willing to dig in and become bored and frustrated and impatient with this topic during the research process? Because it's gonna be a long road. Is this topic in some way timely? Does it matter to the world in some way? It doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be super brand new because that can actually be an issue, but it has to have something to do with this existence. Is there existing research on this topic? Because if it's too fresh, then there may not be enough research, <clears throat> excuse me, for you to dig in and actually come out with your own sort of way to integrate yourself into the discourse about it. And then is it debatable? Is it something where you can make a claim, make an argument, try to prove something? And so if you have all those factors, then the question may be tenable. So from this previous uh, exercise, I picked three things, right? I picked the potential niche topic number one is artificial intelligence and self-driving cars. Um, and I thought about it, I thought, well, it's definitely timely, it's happening, it's, it's debatable, right? There's a lot of different opinions about it. There's some research, there's definitely some research to get started with that, but am I really interested in the topic? Do I have that curiosity factor to sustain myself? So I have to sit with myself and consider it. Uh, potential niche topic number two, artificial intelligence and China's new national security law. <clears throat> well, I'm definitely curious about it and it's definitely timely and there's tons of different opinionating about it, but it's so timely and given the, the, the geographic, the cultural, the political context of it, I don't know how much research is available, um, how accurate it is, how thorough it is, and how open the discourse, the accessibility of that research is. So I, I need to go and I need to dig more deeply into that to figure out if that niche topic is tenable. And then the last one, artificial intelligence and learning management software uh, and, and different uh, pedagogical platforms and things like that. Like I'm definitely curious, as I said before, it is very timely. Um, what's great about it is, is there's all sorts of changing things right now in the context of the pandemic. There may not be a ton of research, but there is a lot of research on learning management software and online teaching because it's been very popular in the past 10 years. So there is definitely research. So that for me, research topic number three seems to be the one that I think I might have uh, the most traction with. <clears throat> So to conclude, what seems to me now at the end of this like, a very long webinar, um, this is sort of the, the formulating a research question
uh, trajectory that I like to lay out for myself. It's not a straight line, though. It's not linear. I just I couldn't find the right graphic for it. Uh, there will be two steps forward and three steps back, but ultimately, you know, starting out with a broad topic, using these types of divergent activities and doing that preliminary reading, going back and doing more thinking exercises, narrowing it down to a niche topic, and then really starting to step into the research and working toward that, that research question that's still open, right? That's still revisable. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you all very much for listening. And again, if you have any questions, uh, you, can, uh, you can do a number of different things. You can visit our website. Perhaps you can find some answers there. Uh, if you're an NU student, faculty, or staff, and you need individual help, you can make um, appointments with the Writing Center. Um, and um, other than that, stay safe, uh, stay well, write well, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.